It's my great pleasure on behalf of the Center of Iranian Studies and the Department of History, Religions and Philosophies, my department, to introduce today's symposium in our series on the idea of Iran. Now, it's thanks to the generosity of the Sudavar Memorial Foundation that we're all here today. This is the 13th in the series, a remarkable achievement without, which without the financial support that we receive from the foundation certainly would not be possible. So that includes the symposia and of course the publications as well. It's wonderful that we can welcome the trustees of the foundation to this year's uh, event. And I would like to extend a special vote of thanks to Mrs. Sudhavar Farman Farmayan for her involvement uh, with the series, her advice and support year on year. Now, Dr. Charles Melville needs no introduction, but we're very pleased that he's joined us to lead the series. It's a pleasure to be working with him. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Suzanne Babayi for leading it over the past two years. Unfortunately, Dr. Hassan Hakimian can't be with us this weekend. He's obviously, as you know, the director of the LMEI. Um, but he's asked me to welcome you all on his behalf. And as you know, it's the team at the LMEI that organized this event. And I would like to thank Louise Hosking and Vincenzo Pacci in particular for their hard work and attention to detail, which makes this series the success that it is. Now, the Center for Iranian Studies was one of the reasons um, why we started this series way back when. It was launched in 2012, and it's now a vibrant hub for events and activities to do with Iran. So if you aren't a member, please look at the website and join, sign up. Um, there are a lot of wonderful events going on this side of Christmas, culminating in what looks to be uh, a fascinating evening um, entitled Bards Apart, a musical performance of the poems of Robert Burns and Hafez. So Nagis Farzad, who will be with us later, I think will be able to tell you more about that. Now, just before I hand over to Charles Melville, I want to introduce and launch the latest in our series. It's volume seven, The Coming of the Mongols. I have to say it's been a very long time in production, and I'm very grateful to my co-editor, David Morgan, for his part in bringing out the book. Also, I'd like to thank Alex Wright and his team at IB Taurus, and Parvis Fuzuni for his usual rigor, patience, and good humor in producing the camera-ready copy. Unfortunately, he can't be with us today. So today and tomorrow, we'll be looking at 15th century Iran and the turco timurid polity. Also, of course, the great literary, artistic, and scientific achievements of that period. We have a wonderful lineup of experts in the field, which is why we've extended this year to a day and a half. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Charles. Thank you. Uh, welcome. I know that uh, we don't need an awful lot from me. I'd just like to thank uh, uh, Fatima for inviting me. And when she did ask me if I'd be willing to take on running the series, my first thought was a story from my old friend Tom Olson, or an idea from my old friend Tom Olson, that whenever you receive an email with a question mark at the end, would you be willing to do something? two red lights should show up on your computer, one N and one O, and you should press these and say no. But of course, I failed to do this, so I'm happy to say I've um, accepted to steer the series through to what I hope is the end of the idea of Iran, if not the end of Iran itself. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm obviously hoping it won't be. This is the whole point. We're going to put Iran up there in beautiful colors. Um, I had thought that the series had slightly lost track of the founding idea, which is the idea of Iran. I mean, we've had lots of nice papers and nice volumes about the history of the region over all the centuries, uh, but not so much focus, I thought, a, a specific focus on what's implied by the idea of Iran. And so I thought it might be helpful just in a rather simplistic way to have a 
uh, a format or a formula to address some of these questions, which I put into three different headings. One is what the Iranians themselves think is the idea of their country. Well, then one is what their contemporaries feel, so in other words, in the Timurid period, what Timurid Iranians thought their country was, and also what contemporaries from outside Iran thought. And then the third component, which has probably been the one most addressed so far, is what we think the idea of Iran is. In other words, what Western scholarship uh, or, or the, um, in, uh, the interpretation uh, that we've put on Iran and her history and culture throughout the uh, eras. So with that in mind, um, I've asked our speakers to think specifically about the idea of Iran under one or other of these headings. And of course, as time goes on, there'll be far more of what other people think or outsiders think, uh, which is not terribly well documented for the earlier periods. As for the title, Turco Timurid Intermezzo, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with uh, Vladimir Minorsky's beautiful formulation of the Iranian intermezzo, which describes the period between the collapse of Arab rule and the beginning of Turkish rule. And it may not seem entirely appropriate to this period because, after all, Turkish rule didn't end. But I think there is something to be noticed about this period after, if you take it roughly from the fall of Baghdad and the collapse of the universal Islamic caliphate uh, until the rise of the Safavids in the early 16th century. Uh, we do see a very discrete period, it seems to me, which is uh, defined perhaps by religion not being at center stage of state ideology. Of course, religion didn't go away, but it was essentially a secular state, I think. And at the end of this period, of course, we see the arrival of these empires, the Ottoman, the Safavid, and the Mughal empires. Uh, especially in Iran, religion once more being the defining plank of state ideology, which it certainly wasn't uh, in the period you might call a sort of Chinggisid dispensation, which really dies out in Iran with the collapse of the Timurids, although of course Timur's influence remained very strong. So, so much for the general idea of the title. Um, I'm very grateful to all the people I invited to speak to accept immediately. Uh, there are so many possible speakers for this period, which is one of the richest and most dramatic, I think, in Persian history. Uh, and I hope that we've achieved a balance of some great stars and leaders in the field, but also trying to introduce uh, some younger scholars, perhaps not quite so well known, who are doing some really interesting work to uh, get a sense of uh, progression in the field. And finally, as, as Sarah has already mentioned, this is a bit of an innovation this year to have it spread over two days. And I know tomorrow morning is Sunday morning and a lot of people seem to lie in bed till lunch, especially in London. So I hope uh, that uh, you won't decide to stay in bed tomorrow morning. And we have John Woods, the great superstar of Timurid history here, deliberately as the last speaker. So if you don't turn up, it'll be a personal insult to him and to me. So without more ado, I'd like to hope uh, you have a very uh, interesting and uh, engaging two days. Thank you very much. In the uh, 15th and er century and earlier, we frequently, of course, see the pairing of Iran-Turan and Turk and Tajik, which represent at once opposition and complementarity. Um, the one in territory and ideology, the other, of course, in culture. These both basically refer to imperial traditions, the Persian and then later Perso-Islamic tradition and the uh, steppe tradition. Now, in the 15th century, both the Caliphate and the United Mongol Empire, of course, were no more. They had been gone for quite a while. So the reality is regional. And this, I think, does show both in politics and in ideology. So what I want to focus on in this paper is the way that universalist imperial ideologies can accommodate sub-imperial identities and regional claims. Now, since this is a conference on the idea of Iran, I want to look particularly, and towards the end of my paper, at Iranian regionalism, 
And to do this, I want to broaden somewhat our view of the holders of Iranian culture. In particular, I want to go beyond the Iranian bureaucrats, ulama and scholarly classes who usually um, get most of our attention because they did most of the writing, uh, and say that these are not the only people who are um, uh, defining Perso Islamic state's craft and identity. What I want then to add to this class is the Iranian regional rulers and elites, including military actors. And I'm going to suggest that by including this class in our view of what Iranian means and who the Iranian elite are, we get a more comprehensive and a, perhaps a richer view of what the Perso Islamic tradition is. So let me then go on to discuss who these uh, other holders of the Iranian tradition are. Um, when looking at the duality of Iran-Turan, Turk-Tajik, one of the standard contrasts has been the, the military superiority of the Turks over the more cultured Tajiks clearly expressed in many histories, which many of us have read, which were written for Turkic rulers and an Iranian audience by Tajik Perso-Islamic bureaucrats. Now, scholars are uh, increasingly asking to what extent we should believe all that bureaucrats write. Um, this is, of course, particularly applied to the great Rashid ad-Din and his version of Mongol history, but it, I think, can be uh, taken as a useful caution for other times as well. And we're also recognizing, um, increasingly, I would say, the importance of local Iranian rulers and their servitors. Um, and here we're talking of military as well as cultural. So if you look at the local histories, you see very active politics, not only by the, the rulers of these areas, but also armies of Iranian soldiers and their commanders, also sometimes acting independently. Sometimes these rulers and armies are acting within a larger state, a Turco-Mongolian state or a larger Iranian state. Sometimes they are acting on their own in local politics. Um, we have excellent histories of the Caspian regions, Mozandaran Gilan, which Charles Melville has worked on recently, very fruitfully. Another famous local set of histories is the histories of Sestan, um, worked on by the, the late uh, Clifford uh, Edmund Bosworth. Farah is another, another example of this that we know less about. Now, these regions remain separate for centuries under sometimes very long-lasting dynasties. One can argue that these regions are atypical, they are isolated geographically in some sense, thus preserving a tradition which is lost elsewhere. However, they are nonetheless strategic regions. The Caspian, after all, goes right along that northern route, very much traveled by armies and others. Um, and they're active within the, the larger regional complex. Sestan, likewise, is connected to Khorasan, to Kerman, but the road between them. More importantly, I think we have to recognize that um, we know about these regions not only because they had important local rulers, but also because they had a local historical tradition. And that is chance, to some extent. They produced local histories, therefore we know about them. So what we need to consider is what exists elsewhere. When we want to look at the Iranian elites, the military activities in particular of other regions, um, we see them mostly in times of disorder, succession struggles. When you look at these times, you see traces of many more local power holders. Um, you can see a useful example in Farumadi's uh, history in the late 14th century, the continuation of Shaban Karai, uh, describing events after the fall of the Ilkhanid dynasty, 
And he has local rulers and armies in Kashan, Save, Qom, Kerman. You see evidence in the period of Shahrukh right up to the end of important local elites in the armies of those same cities, Qom, Save, Kashan, Kashan, well into the period of Shahrukh. Um, and here we're talking, after all, about the central Iranian plateau. These people were militarily active. They had soldiers under them, um, and they were fighting both locally and uh, more, more widely. We also see Iranian soldiers in the provincial Timurid armies, some of them under their own commanders. Now, the Iranians are not in the very top commands usually, but they are active. So these people, I think, must be included in, in what we consider the Iranian uh, formative elite. Since we are going to include these people, we should also then um, consider some of the practices of Iranian dynasties to consider how different these really are from the practice of Turkic dynasties. Um, Perso-Islamic administrative practice is often seen as supporting a centralized bureaucratic state, uh, whereas the Turco-Mongolian tradition is seen as having centrifugal tendencies. So then this centralized versus decentralized government has also sometimes been presented as a fault line between the two traditions, uh, Tajik and Turk. Uh, two particular practices um, are very commonly attributed to Turkic states. Uh, one is shared rule among the family with inheritance within a generation uh, and the granting of appanages. Uh, and these then are seen as, as a, as a um, contrast to Perso-Islamic, both Persian and uh, Arabic. I would argue, and I'm not entirely the first one to say this, um, that although this holds true for you know, centralizing rulers in a larger state where the bureaucrats clearly come in on the centralizing uh, the, the side of things, uh, it is less true when you look at Iranian dynasties themselves. Um, first of all, most Iranian dynasties of the Islamic period, like many Arab dynasties, did not practice primogeniture. They may go, they may have inheritance father to son, but they also frequently pass rule on to brothers. And there are plenty of succession struggles. Um, we also see shared rules, sort of regionally shared rules, uh, under members of the dynasty. The Buyids, of course, in, uh, in, in the uh, Abbasid period are an excellent example of this. The Muzaffarids uh, in the, uh, the, uh, coming in after the Ilkhanids. Also, if you look at the Caspian, the, the Sayyids of Sari and Amul in the Timurid period. And the Kartid dynasty of Herat at the end, you see Serachs, the region is semi-separate. So, I would suggest that although the Turks did indeed have some habits of rule that encourage fragmentation and regional rule, this does not make them outliers. So I am not going to dispute this idea of shared rule, but I'm going to dispute the, the, the idea that this is something different from what other people did. Um, and also, uh, to sum up the section, say Iranians, first of all, are important in the political and military picture outside of the bureaucracy, uh, outside of cities as well as inside of cities, and they had habits of rule which are not entirely different from those of the Turkic dynasties. So to go on then to uh, some shared concepts of rule and the question of regionalism and um, imperialism. Um, it seems clear that um, the concepts of Iran-Turan are indeed a shared, uh, shared concept. Uh, we see them both in text and in action. 
Um, and the understanding of the boundary also seems to be shared. That is to say, it stands at the oxus. Here, you're talking mostly about the central oxus, um, sort of above head up. Um, so there does seem to be an agreement that that is the boundary between Iran and Turan. Now, for both the Iranians and the Turco-Mongolian dynasties, likewise, although the, symbolically the, Oxford, the Oxus um, is very important, um, it's not always quite as fully relevant as the east-west divisions, which is what I want to look at here uh, a little while. Um, this well known that Iran tends to be divided east and west, Khorasan versus central and western Iran, and that will be talked about in other papers I know uh, at this conference. Um, this then also becomes part of the picture uh, for the Turco Mongolian rule in the Middle East. It follows very much the same template. Uh, one center in the west, around Tabriz. Um, which is sort of for Western and Central Iran, another in Khorasan. Eastern Khorasan then came under the Chagadayid Khanate, separate from the Ilkhanid dynasty, centered in largely in Western Iran. And the central part of Khorasan was uh, then contested between the two. At the fall of the Ilkhanate, we see the differences in ideology as well among these regions, and now actually see three regions showing splits in how the steppe heritage is understood or practiced. In Anatolia, Western, Western Iran and West of Iran, you go largely back to the Seljukid Oroz myth of the, of the sort of great Turks for legitimation. In Azerbaijan and central Iran, they looked mostly to the Chinggisid, but very much through the Ilkhanids. And in that region, they were willing quite soon, by about uh, mid-14th century, to let go of exclusive Chinggisid, the exclusive Chinggisid right to sovereignty and to use Khan for other people as well. Khorasan and, and parts east, however, stuck to a more conservative Chinggisid ideology in which, in fact, the Chinggisid still did have the, uh, the monopoly of, of actual sovereignty. And this division remains uh, through the Timurids, um, even though um, Timur and Shah Rukh very much combined united, I should say, the Ilkhanid and the Chagadayid Khanids, um, the Khorasanian elite are clearly more fully included in the, in the Timurid uh, top command than are the elites of, of Western Iran and Central Iran. Now, there are other divisions also that are important at this period uh, for the Timurids and others, and I'm going to go quickly over these, so I'm departing a little bit from the Iranian for a while. Um, although uh, Timur himself attempted a sort of symbolic recreation of the Mongol Empire, he and his successors also differentiated themselves quite clearly from other parts of the Mongol Empire. Um, First of all, they chose the Persianate region as their center. Um, the eastern Chadayids become the Chete, the, the robbers, therefore inferior. The Uzbeks were uncouth, um, not, as, not as Persianate, not as educated as the uh, Timurids. And the Turkmen were clearly inferior, as not having been part of the, the Mongol Empire. The other thing that the Timurids used as, as both as legitimation and as regional identity was the shared history of Iranian Turkic rule. Uh, so when uh, Timur as, as, assigned Azerbaijan to his son Miran Shah, he called it the Kingdom of Hulegu, thus the Ilkhanate. And we often find the Ilkhanate as a, as a, as a uh, term for that part of Iran. Uh, the southeastern regions of his realm, uh, Ghazna and Kabul, uh, 
were the realm of Mahmud of Ghazna. Thus, again, going back to a shared history. And to go beyond the two Murids, when uh, the great Bayezid, Yildir and Bayezid, was heading east uh, to face Timur, he asked the Mamluks for recognition by the caliph as the heir to the Rum Seljukids. So the recent history is very much part of the, um, of the world view of what rule means and what a region was. Let's look then finally at um, Iranian tradition and um, regional rule. So here I want to look a little bit at the at Iranian regions and their ideological underpinnings. Local histories um, often give genealogies of Iranian rulers going back to the Sasanians and back to the Shahnameh. Many of these are quite grand and we can question their believability. But what is more interesting, I think, is that a number are also very distinctly regional. So this is local legitimation within a larger Iranian tradition, just as we have seen with the Turks, with the Timurids and others, that there is a local legitimation, but it is expressed often within, a, um, within an imperial framework. So the local histories of the Caspian region, several take the story back to Gov Bera, the legendary uh, king of Gilan and Tabaristan. Mar'ashi, writing in the late um, 15th century, takes the genealogy of the Baduspanids who ruled in um, Tabaristan parts of Tabaristan, 11th to 16th centuries, in a continuous line through the Sasanians back to Baduspan ben Gofbara. He also, because he came from a ruling family, connects his own line to the same, to the same um, genealogy through the Bovandid dynasty, also of a similar region, um, in Tabaristan. And here we have in, uh, in Marashi actually one of our rather rare examples of a voice that is from the local military um, Iranian elite. So it's a particularly interesting and rich history. Um, in Sestan and Farah, the kings likewise go back to the Sasanian period actually the beginning um, with Ardashir as the founder of their main city, Zarang. They themselves attach themselves um, to, to Khosrow. They also go back to um, Iranian legend. Here the rather shadowy Gashasp, said to have ruled over Sistan and Zabulistan. Now, when we move to um, less visible local powers in the more central locations, clearly we have a much more difficult time uh, connecting them back. We don't have information on their genealogies. The history simply don't give us those. Um, and we have no idea of what legitimation they used, by and large, because they appear you know, very, uh, very briefly on the stage. What we do, however, have is evidence that local identity is very much connected back to the Iranian past. Um, we have quite a lot of this preserved for us in the geography of hafez e -Abru. Here, of course, as in all geographies, you have a repetition of earlier geographies. You cannot say that this is new with hafez e -Abru, but it is preserved, and thus one can say it is, it is being preserved, it is being passed on, it still exists. hafez e -Abru wrote under Shahrukh. Um, 
a very nice, fairly comprehensive geography in which he gives quite a lot of history up to the present. And among the things he includes for many places are descriptions of pre-Islamic organization. He gives that, for instance, for both Khorasan and Fars. He also will include the foundation myths of histories, of cities, I mean, which were founded in the uh, pre-Islamic period. Esfizari, a bureaucrat, a Khorasanian bureaucrat who wrote in the late 15th century, wrote a treatise on Herat and its region, which includes quite a lot of uh, local lore. Um, also brings in the Iranian past. Uh, both he and Hafez Abru go back to the Shahnameh as well, both for regions and for specific places. So for instance, you have in Hafez Abru a mountain in Ghur, uh, east of Herat, uh, where Zal was kept, apparently, by the Simor. Um, also, a, the location of a fortress built, built by Kai Khosro after killing Afrasiyab. So why then would the regional loyalty of Iranian leaders matter to us? Um, I'm going to suggest that um, the existence of this elite of local uh, military and uh, landed elites um, is politically important as well as culturally important. These are the people through whom regions are ruled on the ground, who come into the regional armies. They are the ones who do or who do not support Turco-Mongolian and larger Iranian rulers. One of the things we have to recognize here, I think, is that we know very little. This is a sad thing to say, as when you get as far as I am in, in my academic career of all the years I've spent studying. We know about the big cities, we know about the courts, we do not know much about the other regions, but that does not mean they don't matter. Uh, these are, in fact, the people whom one needs to have on one side. And we don't know much about them. At the time of a conquest or the arrival of a governor, you find very usually a standard phrase that the local powers come to pay their respects. These are not, I think, only the ulama. These are, in fact, these local people. Um, and they better come, because if they don't, you're in trouble. These are also very important in succession struggles, of which you have a great number at regular intervals, and in rebellions. Um, a notable example here is the rebellion that happened at the end of the reign of Shah Rukh in the uh, 1440s. His grandson, Muhammad Sultan, governor of uh, Qom and uh, that region, began to gather support and to become in, uh, assert independence. There's a lot been written about the Iranian notables of Esfahan who supported him, but these were not the only ones. One danger was that he was attracting other local rulers of, re, of, lo, of nearby regions. So the regional lo loyalties and the actions of these Iranian landed military elites do provide another factor which could very strongly influence the outcome of succession struggles or the success of a larger power taking over a region. So in conclusion, I want to suggest that there is more to the definition of Iran and Turan than two unitary spheres. Both are very much subdivided both by region and by historical consciousness. And this comes out sometimes in the writing, uh, but also in terms of political actions. <laughs> 
And that these divisions, um, regional and, as I say, historical, may be just as important as the division between the two. They are important in legitimating rule, in the formation of a realm, um, and they, they come in then together. There's a universal aspect, but there's also a local and uh, regional aspect. Likewise, I think when we are looking uh, at what worked towards cohesion and centralization and what worked against, we need to take into consideration not only Turco-Mongolian concepts of rule, but also the regional political traditions of the Iranians as well as those of the Turks. Thank you. Uh, the work I made in the last two months, I had a great confusion in my mind on this subject. Uh, we can, I, I want to start uh, with a long chapter of the Zafar Nameh by Nizamuddin Ali, uh, Nizamuddin Shami, narrating the siege of Aleppo. It describes, uh, Nizamuddin Shami describes a discussion between two factions rose up among the besieged Mamluks in the town uh, which tried to establish a strategy against Timur and his army. Shami notes that the taking of Bahasna by Timur produced great panic among the Mamluk forces. Timur Tash, who was the Malik al Omara in uh, Aleppo, sent a report describing the situation to the Lord of Egypt, Valiye Misr, uh, who mobilized various Mamluk Amirs who reached Aleppo and met to see how they could help Timur Tash, governor of the town. The Amirs convened a great assembly. The Malik of Umara of Damascus, Sudun, joined Timur Tash with a great army and together they formed an even stronger one. Shami underlines the psychological attitude of Timur Tash, who according to the Persian Chronicle, Claire, uh, was cleverer than the others and showed particular prudence. In a public speech, he urged the people not to take reckless decisions and to decide prudently by deliberating intelligently and unanimously coming to a decision. These people who approach us have a king that they perceive to be as fierce as Genghis Khan and they believed to be welcomed by humankind. Sharafuddin Ali Yazdi added later to Shamir's words that Timur Tash exhorted the people to include the name of Timur in the khutbah and in the coinage. Shami then offers a vivid picture of the discussion which opened among the participants. Whatever come, came to their mind, they said openly until they adopted a common strategy and proclaimed, this person, Shachs, is assisted by God, and everywhere he went, he conquered. Those who stood up to him and made great efforts against him and the sultans of the entire world finally surrendered to him, because it is impossible to oppose such a man. The final suggestion was to yield to the invader. According to Shami, other less experienced people, heeded by Sudun, reacted vehemently and exalted the value of the Mamluk army, which was greater in number, had better fortification and more solid fortresses. Here Sudun introduced a very interesting subject, the architectural virtues of the Mamluk buildings as against those of the Timurids. Their castles are mainly made with mood and earth. Our castles and our towns are made of stone and, or even of steel. According to Sudun, the siege of the Mamluk towns would take the Timurid months and even years. He invited all the participants to consider the difference between Mamluk weapons and those of the Timurids. He exalted the bows of 
from Damascus, Egyptian swords, Arab spears, and the shields from Aleppo. Sudun Harang continue, continued, and he cited reasons they need not worry about the size of the Timurid army and asserted that in the Mamluk kingdom there are 60,000 villages and townships um, registered. Oh, and if only one person came from each village, they would prevail over the Timurids. They stay in the desert. We are in castles. The walls of their houses are of skin and ropes. Our castles are of stone and iron. A group of Balenced people invited the assembly to use a certain prudence in war and litigation. The twists and turns of fate are unknown, and it could be useless and foolish to oppose the celestial decrees and sacrifice their sons and risk the destruction of their property. The discussion continued with a further call for, for, war, for war from the faction of war supporters. A group of Persians, Jamoati as Ajam, who were famous for their good lifestyle, on observing the various opinions in the assembly, proposed their opinion as independent and invited the assembly not to decide with haste and to consider the consequence carefully. But this call was also rejected by the warmongers, who even accused the Persians of being spies and plotting secretly to assist the Mongols to invade the kingdom again one day. Here, Shami introduced a typical rhetorical device, intellect loaded at this, but time wept for their state, and adds that they forbade these good counselors from leaving the town. The defense of the town, walls, uh, towers, and fortification was prepared. In the meantime, the Timurid army slowly advanced into Syrian territory. According to Yazdi, in a tradition Mongol tactic, Timur st simulated escape and drew the enemy into an ambush. Shami gives a slightly different version of the story. The Mamluks were so frightened that they ran away, turning their backs and on the Timurid army. Various Mamluks, Amir, and infantrymen were killed. The gateway of Aleppo was covered with heaped bodies, and the Mamluk cavalry rode over them and entered the town. The Timurid army were hot on their heels and killed several with arrows and swords and were trodden down by the horses. Having captured Aleppo, they took the people prisoners and plundered great quantity of gold, riches, and textile. Suddenly, Shami, who reports his personal testimony of the event, noticed that the door of the fortress opened and other valiant soldiers tried, tied together a rope and uh, the end of which was held by some people in the towers. But the sortie uh, was a, a failure, and so on. Um, at the end, Timur sent an envoy uh, to the people in the citadel with a suggestion for the imprudent, imprudent besieged people, inviting them to save their lives. He described his military success as a consequence of God's support for him to conquer the whole world. At this moment, Sudun and Timurtash with the Cadiz, the Imams and the, and the town authorities with the keys of the town and those of the treasury opened the gate of the fortress and surrendered to Timur, who put Sudun and Timurtash in chains and threw them into jail. I introduce it here, this long passage, because it is the representation of a sort of debate on clash of civilization. 
and probably its insertion in a chapter of Zafarnami of Shami appears not a casualty, but express in a certain way some personal ideas of the same author of the Chronicle. The perception of the Timurids as a nomadic people who live in tents in a, and is stranger to the urban society is well described by the author who probably used this expedient to describe a needed opinion. Timurids were successful in a fatalistic vision of the ineluctability of the Timurid victory. In this frame, the presence of the Persian community of Aleppo, who invited the governor of Damascus to reconsider his plans, appears as an interesting element. The adoption of a Turco-Mongolian lord seemed to be a sort of inescapable fate, and the refusal to submit to him coincided to a sort of self-destruction, a challenge to God's will. The same conflict with the Mamluks could help us for the understanding of the Persian role. Yazdi, for example, gave a negative example when he describes the curious episode of Sultan Hussein, grandson of Timur, a prince who had shown his bravery on various occasions, but was convinced by a group of Persian seditious men, Mufsidan, and by the mob to pass the lines and enter Damascus. Sultan Hussein was received in Cairo as a sultan and was displayed to the people in the town. He was welcomed by Faraj himself, who treated him as an intimate and imagined future victory. Concerning this example, example rightly Beatrice Manser notes the attitude of Timur and his followers toward the Persians, combining familiarity and contempt, led them to constrict the role of Persian bureaucrats. The epithet Tajik Mizaj, Mizaj, Persian natured, is found in the history as an expression of contempt. When princes of the royal house misbehaved, as occasionally happened, the responsibility was quickly assigned to the Persian in their entourage. The influence of these corrupt people was seen as the cause of Amir and Shah excesses, and um, when he went insane for the failure of Pir Muhammad ben uh, Omar uh, Shaikh to go in campaign, as ordered in uh, 1399, and for the defection of Timur's grandson, Sultan Hussein. This is the case. Nevertheless, the debate in the 14th century involves a more wide polemic. This was certainly the residual of the Ibn Taymiyyan ideas against the Mongols, and we could enlist various episodes of harsh criticism against Timur as a barbarian, even though this term has no exact equivalent in Persian. This is the case of the vehement invective pronounced by Borhanuddin of Sivas, according to the Basmurasm of Aziz Astarabadi in 1394, who describes Timur's behavior a consequence of his corruption, a form of heretical hostility against the law and the Sharia, a clear expression of his lack of loyalty. The conduct of Timur is for Burhanuddin against the Fotovat and the Morovat. For this reason, the Muslim people have to go to great lengths to defend themselves against him. How this lack of civilization could be, in this case, associated to the Turco-Mongolian origins it's not clear. Certainly, Burhanuddin considered himself an heir of the Persian administrative tradition, even considering himself a member of the Salur ethnic group and writing also in Turkish some poetry. In a certain, in a chapter of his Persephone, Bert Fragner introduces a persuasive paragraph dedicated to the distinction between the Islamic identity and the Iranisches Geschichtsbewusstsein, 
defining this double way of interpretation, Fragner introduced a convincing factor in the long debate on the idea of Iran, which is today the object of this conference. Timur pe Timurid period can be considered in this sense a consequence or better, a maturation of something which was elaborated in previous period. Certainly, one of the main protagonists of this process is the Timurid histor historiography, which is permeated by an idea of, of Iran, even though this idea appears in this later period as a late elaboration and should be not considered as something particularly original. Um, rather than, in some cases, a fossil of previous idea. Moreover, the dichotomy between identity and Geschichtsbewusstsein appears here particularly useful, combining two factors apparently in contrast, which certainly had a substantial impact in the idea of Iran. As I demonstrated elsewhere, we can also individuate a Turko Mongol Geschichtsbewusstsein and even others. Turkish presence in the Islamic world is well attested from the 9th century, but there is no trace of a Turkish identity. This is, I, I, I find, a very good distinction. And as a social phenomenon, the fact that this Turkish presence is represented only by search re not written in Turkey cannot be considered as a good reason for the exclusion of the Turkish people from this great big game of hegemonies in Persia and even in other countries. In this sense, two other words can be spent on the various intermezzos, uh, Iranian intermezzo, uh, Turkmen intermezzo, uh, which are a reflection of a real uh, dynastic dimension of Iranian historiography more than a concrete description of the Iranian society. The question is the use of Persian language, and perhaps also, and the Persian administrative and political experience in the courts of Iran and Central Asia. Certainly, Ghaznavid court represent the main model in that sense, especially during Mahmud of Ghazna period, but even during the reign of the later Ghaznavid Shahs. This model was built to contrast other models, like the Karahanid, one which, uh, Karakhanid one, which spent some energies for a demonstration of a Turkish ethnic belonging with the use of language, but were aware of the importance of Persian, as Yuri Karev recently demonstrated with various archaeological evidences. The use of Persian in Ghazni, even though in a moderate way, represents a specific effort Moreover, the so-called Ghaznavid Gaz Pleiad of Persian poets attests of a precise aim together with other confirmed by the presence of Persian verses in the Ghaznavid palaces. How and when this model strongly influenced the Timurid one? This question permeates a large part of Timurid historiography where Mahmud appears as a model. This is the case uh, firstly, of the Gazavate Hindustan by Yasuddin Ali Yazdi, where Mahmud is really the main model, is the, the, um, the precursor, as you say. Before tracing uh, an history of this phenomenon, I would like to underline the double nature of the assumption of Persian self representation. From one side, we could note the fact that sources are written in great majority in Persian, of course, by Persian and generally for a Turco-Persian public. I am convinced, as the case of the above-mentioned chapter on Aleppo, that the mention of Persian or of the Persian civilization allows frequently the authors to introduce some of their own ideas. When Giasuddin Ali Yazdi reposed the defeat, defeat inflicted by the Timurid to the Muzaffarid Lord Shah Mansur, his old protector, protector of Giasuddin Ali Yazdi, this personage appears as a hero who is almost able to fight against Timur himself in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
Mansuri consider, is considered as a brave warrior, and compared to Rustam, he appears even stronger than, than Rustam. Nevertheless, the fate, once again, appears as the basic element of Timur's success, and Shah Mansur was killed. Yasuddin Ali Yazdi and Nizamuddin Shami introduced precious biographical note, notes in which are clearly expressed the sense of otherness about Timur in a disguised way. In the same time, they built the figure of the Turanian Shah in a typical Iranian way, using various expedients, among them the idea of something which is the unavoidability of the fate, and in the case of Yasuddin Ali Yazdi, also the use of the Quranic term Basira, that is, the deep vision, justify all worst deeds of Timur. There is only a few examples in Persian literature of an explicit criticism, real criticism of the Turkish power. Some of them are, for example, in the work of Masoud Isadi Salman in Ghaznavid period. Uh, during his life, uh, he met various difficulties in, in his relation with the Ghaznavid aristocracy um, of his time. He wrote a satirical prose in a part of his long Shah Rashub devoted to the town of Lahore in the second half of the 12th century. Masoud, Masoud Esad Salman used sarcastic words against the Amir of the court because they had ridiculed him in the Majlis. The same chapter is also dedicated to an encomium of this court secretary, the Persian court secretary, and the doctors. This contrastive chapter is, in fact, resumed uh, the, uh, that Persian poetry was clearly adopted as something necessary by the Ghaznavid Amirs, who in any case were not so interested by the contents of, of poetry in this case, rather than by the use of Persian as an instrument for celebrate them. The contrast among the Persian Dabir's doctor and other secretaries of the court with the Turkish Amir is clearly cut and shows the deep division of the society in two parts. The Turkish rudeness is described by various other authors, certainly in the Chahar Mahale, the allusion to the satirical verse where Mahmoud is described as a son of slaves, uh, that is a Turk, a Turk uh, shows a consciousness of the different ways to interpret the Persian literature by the Turk. The same Nezami Arouzi described frequently the Turks uh, even as cultivated figures like Alp Tegin, but also as raw figures like Sebük Tegin, and finally the same Mahmoud. Alp Tegin appears in the Siyasat Name of Nezam al Mulk as a model of good Turk, ready for a Persian, ready for a Persian acculturation. We could trace here an history of the Turkish perception by the Persians with other examples. This is the case of the critics made by Rashid Odin to the Turks, which include the Mongols and other people of, of, the, of the Iran in this period, and various satirical invectives made by Ubaid Zagani against the Turks, against the Mongols, as a rude military element in the society of his time. Moreover, it is not the case to return here on the work of uh, various scholars, Jean Aubin and recently David Durangedi, who perceived this dichotomy in Persian society at the point to describe the history of Saljuk or Ikanid periods as the era of the Persian administrative elite and the Turco-Mongolian military class of governors. How such dichotomy is perceived in Timuri time? Apparently, there was a great change, and the Persians appeared as supporters of the Timurid advance, but with a secondary role. 
Considering the large debate in the Islamic world on legitimacy during the 14th century and the systematic attack against Timur in terms of bad Islamic lord, we should underline that the Persians who were engaged by the Timur for the elaboration of the imperial chronicles tried systematically a propagandistic re-evaluation of its figure using classical argument. This is the case of the even limited use of the Shahnameh or the exaltation of the concept of Iran and Turan. Other more subtle implications could be detected in Timurid chronicles. If the Anatolian campaign, as well as the Mamluk ones, were the, the most ideologically constructed in the main frame of the imperial policy of Timur, the large number of sources on this campaign from opposite sides allows us to identify some stereotype and accusation made both by Timur and against him and in which the term Turkmen, in this case, plays its part. A few examples will clarify this point. On the one hand, as John Woods noted, there is, for example, Ibn al-Furat, who considers Timur as an atabeg, or of the king of the Tatars, that is, a chief of Turkmen soldiers, who takes order from a Mongol Khan. The Khan is the uh, Soyur Gatmish, the lord of the Chagatai Dolus, the Ugudeid lord of it. On the other hand, we have the Zafar Name of Sharafuddin Ali Yazdi, where we find a letter to, by Timur uh, to Bayezid, in which the Sultan is accused of being a seaman, Kyashtibon, of Turkmen origin. The author further comments in a verse that the Turkmen are far from wisdom. He has as Herad Torkman Binasib. The use of the derogative term Kyashtibon derives probably from the activity of the Ottomans in the Dardanelles and their conquest of the Balkans. But Jurgen Paolo, who approached the question of how the sources, mainly those of the 15th century, could allow one to trace specific terminology concerning the pastoral nomads and the Turks, the Turkmen, etc., uh, mainly focusing on the occurrence of certain terms like Sahran, Eshin, and Hasham, uh, but uh, uh, for other vaguer words like uh, Turkmen, Turks, Tatars, and Mongols, uh, was uh, more discreet. As for these terms, Paul, Paul underlines the fact that Turkmen, like Turks and Mongols, are seen as nomadic no more frequently than Iranian-speaking groups and Arabs. In conclusion, the hybrid uh, society of the 15th century showed a radical change compared with the early Turkish dynasty of Iran. Now, Persians appear as a silent minority who, majority, sorry, who collaborate with the political power, even though with a nostalgic perception of a golden age of Iranian society. This mythical era is frequently evoked as a model, but in a conventional way. In fact, the priority of Turco-Mongol Turco world excludes Persians from any political decision real political decision. The, intentional, the international game among the main power of the time, including the Ottomans who won in Nicopolis an important battle against the Christian West, the Mamluk power, which was protected from Timurid attacks during, uh, the, till the end of the 14th century by the charisma of Sultan Barkouk, the Tugras, who were object of admiration by Timurid himself for the reign of Firusha, but expressed later a weak nature during the reign of Mahmud and Malukhan. The same appears even for the reign of the Khadi Burhanuddin of Sivas and its inglorious hand. All these Turk Turkmen kingdoms are considered with a sort of diminutio capitis as powers where the ancient lord aims were betrayed.
by the new rulers. In particular, it is the case of the Ottomans and the Tuglaks, which are, in the Timurid source, the object of a deep criticism, receiving the Beyliks leaders from Anatolia, who switched sides and joined the Timurid army, Timurid sources considered them Turkmen in a derogative way. Timur gave them a specific status of as lords, governors, generally hakims in the vilayats, vilayats of Rum. Sharafuddin described this as, less, as a lesser evil the inability of Murad I to conquer the Velayats of Aydin, Menteshe, Germian, and Karaman produced such a consequence. The Persian historians, in other words, are forced to justify the differences among the various factions of the Turk Turkman world, exalting the personal charisma of certain lords or the errors made during the past. The Persian model used justified the Timurid intervention in a world which is pervaded by the Turkish presence. They tried in a certain way to furnish a hierarchy of powers in that context which was uh, defined Turkmen Ler Deriyase by Mustafa Ali Effendi. A useful definition re-employed recently by Shahin Mustafayev who underlined the perpetuation of it in the Akko-Yulu period, for example. It is not a case that Tursun Bey, who frequently quotes words by word the work of Sharafuddin Ali Yazdi, in his chronicle, where he exalts the deed of Mehmed II, uses the, this argument, establishing the new hierarchy for the Lord of his time, for the uh, orders of his time, and using exactly the same uh, Persian propaganda. Thank you. I've been toiling in the garden of Timurid painting for a significant number of years, of decades. It's actually just now a momentously significant number of decades. I've thanked various people last and foremost I would be unspeakably remiss not to thank my late and much-loved spouse, to whose memory I dedicate this presentation, as always and without whom. For it was he who suggested that I step eastward from my study of Franco-Flemish illuminated manuscripts in the 14th and 15th centuries and enter the Timurid garden. Many decades have passed since he made that suggestion. The garden flourishes. Like all living things, it needs continuous tending. For one thing, it's grown, not uncontrollably, but greatly. Much work has been done since 1967, and the issues that now animate our study within the broader confines of the subject have naturally altered in that half century. Consider this. The program of a meeting in 1991, focusing on Timurid material culture and its legacy, probably organized in the wake of the Sackler Gallery's Timur and the Princely Vision, sponsored, as you can see, by the Royal Asiatic Society and held in the building across the way more than a quarter of a century ago. The program for our meeting today is rather different, not particularly visual, perhaps. Yet I'm certain that none of our distinguished colleagues, historians, and literary colleagues alike would question that there is an immensely important visual aspect to the Turco-Timurid century in these lands. Architecture, of course, is one. This is the way to Gazer Ga, a photograph of 1971. Um, architecture, of course, is one of the important visual aspects of the 15th century. Buildings of whatever scale and function provided the physical setting in which Timurids and Turkmen's rulers and subjects lived and worked. As with the arts of the book, this material has been much studied in recent decades. Its content, as well as its engines, the economic and social processes that shaped it, and the many persons who sponsored it, designed, built, decorated it with glazed tiles on portals, internal facades, domes and minarets, <coughs> 
All of this is now fairly well documented and better understood. New discoveries, including heretofore unrecognized Timurid constructions, for example, in Fars province, like the fortress at Marge and the Hanaka at Bidahvid, may now be fitted with dif little difficulty into a chronology of type, of place, of sponsor. And Timurid Samarkand will shortly appear before us. The Timurid book offers a peculiarly different view of the 15th century visual arts in the Eastern world. At their finest, these volumes are supreme examples of the taste for the intricate, as Maria Subtelny so well expressed it more than two decades ago. But they almost always function as a carrier of another paramount Timurid art, texts of all kinds, especially of belles lettres. This is in some contradistinction to other small, intricately patterned Timurid objects, such as Ulu Beg's beautiful little wooden casket, its finely carved ornament, uh, that's the casket on the lower left, and a number of drawings from the Topkapi albums uh, on, uh, all around it. They, these designs on ob are clearly the forerunners of what happens on so many objects, in, including the non-illustrative arts of the Timurid book. In fact, it's really impossible to separate the literary arts of this period from the arts that went into the making of a fine Timurid volume. Such aspects of such volumes include paper, the fine writing transcribed on that paper, the painted and gilded ornament that adorns so many pages in these manuscripts, their bindings. This is from a, a, a selection of poetry by Jami. It's quite late. We'll see others that are earlier. And then, of course, the illustrations that have long been the means for so long now, almost the sole feature by which the history of the art of the book in the 15th century has been established. My brief for this meeting was to discuss the, quote, reflection of the Timurid era, unquote, in the arts of the book made in that era. For all the obvious reasons, especially space and time, it seemed right to limit my focus to the best 15th century Eastern books since their look in good part really does define one aspect of the idea of Timurid, Iran, if we dare to use that term. And one more cautionary note uh, seems to happen to all of us. My treatment of the subject as expressed in my abstract has changed since I composed it some months ago. We'll get there. Digging now fairly deeply into the Timurid garden, it's clear that the landscape and its layout have quite changed in the last half century. One reason is naturally the sheer passage of time and our accumulated knowledge of the material. Another is an appreciation of 15th century painting styles other than the classical, a taste I shared, if not with my beloved husband, with my maître B.W. Robinson, Robbie, as he liked to be called, Doyen of the study of Persian painting and not just in the English speaking world. Still another reason is the identification and the subsequently revised estimation of the manuscripts created under, for, by, choose your word, the Turkmen dynasties, both black and white. By the later 1960s, colleagues in the Topkapi Library, Phyllis Chaman and Zerin Tanindu, and then Rabi were making us all recognize the extraordinary quality of the court-sponsored manuscripts made for these princes, as they were also readying us to reconsider the extensive commercial bookmaking industry in later 15th century Shiraz, one of whose essential features was the adoption of the Turkmen illustrative mode at its simplest, and it is very simple. A fourth reason is the belated recognition that the remarkable arts of the book in the 15th century in Iranian lands include far more than its illustrations. Illustrations were really um, what the beginning scholars in our field worked in. The attitude is inherent in the titles of Ivan Stukin's pioneering series of systematic surveys published between 1928 and 1977 
virtually all of them begin les peintures des manuscrits, dot, dot, dot. Especially now is their illumination, as you may appreciate from the image still before us, along with bindings and sometimes even paper. All of these things count very much in our estimation of the arts of the book. Uh, this picture will not tell you, but the remainder of the manuscript from which this comes, it's made, I think, from 19, uh, in 1478, is copied on Chinese paper with gold-drawn landscapes. And there are other manuscripts of this period in which the paper is quite astonishing, often Chinese, often colored. Um, looking at something the other day in the British Library, I picked up one manuscript, the little, um, we'll see it on my list, made in Shemacha, a manuscript that isn't more than this big. And it's so heavy because the paper is glazed Chinese paper, the paper is coated with kale, and it's so much heavier than any other kind of thing. It's partly why we need to look at the real things. In any case, we look at um, illumination in a way we didn't. Turkmen illumination is particularly and astonishingly different, as you see from what's on the screen still. And so I'm going to quote myself in a conversation in the later 1970s in Robert Skelton's office in the v &A, to the effect that illumination would surely provide a key to unlocking some of our problems in understanding the development of the Persian art of the book, particularly its painting. And of course, it's Elaine Wright who has now helped us focus on the non-illustrative components of these fine 15th century manuscripts. Her look of the book makes us truly aware that henceforth, we must always take the non-illustrative features of any fine book into any account of the arts of the Eastern manuscript. A fifth reason, equally self-evident, is the more recent entry into the Timurid garden of so many younger, better equipped, better trained scholars. Passion, careful thinking, and their sheer hard work along with time all combine to alter the way we now examine evaluate, interpret the stuff of our study from what had seemed important in, say, as late as 1991. One fundamental change is embodied in the very nomenclature of the period, as well as the title of this 13th idea of Iran. I have to say that it's not euphonious. So when, herefore, henceforth, I say Timurid, you must understand that I also am aware that it's Turkmen as well. Uh, just as we may no longer ignore the significant Turkmen components in the arts of 15th century Eastern book, even if there's still some imbalance in the way we still recognize them or fail to recognize them. <coughs> that was my original list, was to demonstrate the theme by looking in brief at the components of these 10 superb manuscripts, dated or datable, made throughout the century and thus spanning it. Not that such an examination wouldn't shed much light on it. It's a good way to go through the course of the century. I abandoned that plan for reasons that seemed smart less than three weeks ago, but let me start with the list nonetheless. My intention was that it cover the century of the turco timurid intermezzo. It begins with the celebrated late 14th century copy of some Mathnavis of the poet known as Huaju Kermani, made not for a Timurid or a Turkmen patron, but for Sultan Ahmad Jalair, Turko-Mongol by descent, and one of the most sophisticated bibliophiles of the age, ruling serially from Ardabil, Tabriz, and then Baghdad from 1382 to his death in 1410. The survey ends close to the end of the century with a copy of the celebrated poem, uh, celebrated copy of the celebrated poem of the mystical poet Farid din Attar, an equally celebrated volume begun in Herat at the circle of the last Timurid ruler, Sultan Hussein Baikara, but left unfinished for more than a century. The um, Ebru around it is, of course, later. Um, probably the gold spattering is, doesn't seem to be the wildestly splendid, most splendid of images, but I think the two vertical panels on the, uh, the lower level are much later than the illumination above it. 
In other words, it's one of those many manuscripts that was not finished when it, at the time that it was begun, and so it has a complex history. Some in this audience looking at this list will, of course, see lacunae. You see that the manuscripts, the numbers could have been doubled, trebled, quadrupled, and they were a selection only. Those who know the subject well will have observed that the manuscript from which comes the beautiful image used on the announcement and the program for this meeting is not there. Um, it's, of course, a celebrated Hamsa of Nizami, one painting bearing the date 900, 1494-5, and a number of, with a number of illustrations considered to be the work of Kamal ad-Din Behzad. It's not even on my list. Nor is this. Uh, this is Timur, later Timur and Zafarnam and made for Sultan Hussein Baikara. Choices, choices, as my late father used to lament. Nonetheless, all of these manuscripts represent in all of the essential ways the arts of the 15th century Eastern book. And so I'm going to run through some of the things that they all suggest together. To begin with, they're virtually all made at the behest of princely patrons, Jalairid, Timurid, Turkman, sponsored, commissioned, ordered, choose your verb, but all connected in one way or another with a person of rank and means, well-educated, with exacting standards, who all as well shared that Timurid taste for the intricate. They were made in a number of different and significant centers, the majority, of course, in Herat, big red letters. Um, we need to keep in mind, however, that Samarkand, just under the X of Transoxiana, and Tabriz, and Shemacha, which was on the list probably under Kubachi, um, Shiraz, Isfahan, are also places where many of these manuscripts were made. They contain works composed in Arabic, that's part of an Arabic Quran um, composed for, made for Shah Ruh on the left. In Eastern Turkish. <coughs> I seem to have missed that one. Oh no, that's on the right. The mother tongue of many of the princes of 15th century Iran. And in Persian, of course, in the center. The language of the educated class to which most of these patrons belonged by birth, by education, by both. These manuscripts were transcribed in both Arabic and in Uyghur scripts uh, by some of the finest calligraphers anywhere in the Muslim world. On the left is a work of Azhar. Um, at a time when a fine calligraphic hand was a cultural desideratum and when demonstrated by princes such as Bazungur, um, such calligraphic skill called forth notable comments of approbation. The panel is the end of the inscription on the um, entrance portal of the Mosque of Gauhar Shad in Mashhad. Baizangor designed it, signed it. I think the date is um, 821, 1418. In content, all these books are both religious and secular. In literary genre, they are prose and poetry. There is the Quran. I also have to say, and I have to say that I'm pleased that I discovered it, it's in Detroit, the city in which I grew up, and it looks very normal at this point, but it too has pages of that extraordinarily colored paper. I just didn't know quite how to get colored pictures from the website onto a PowerPoint. Take my word for it or look on the website. It's just fantastically colored. Um, there is this equally celebrated manuscript that only recently came to light, uh, the Naj al-Faradis, an Eastern Turkish religious work, prose of great simplicity is the text, but with a fervently proselytizing purpose. This is not the Paris Mirage Nome, it's not quite the same text. Uh, this is a later copy made for Sultan Abu Said and um, the Turkish uh, at the very top um, is obviously a translation probably made in Istanbul for those who did not read Uyghur. There are, of course, volumes of the most important and most beloved works of Persian poetry. Ferdowsi Shahnameh, 
This is a photograph taken live in the Gulistan Palace Library, again by the person who's not here, taken, I think, in 1959. There are, of course, works by Nizami. This is the famous Khamsa of Five Princes, and it is a Turkmen production to begin with. There are other texts, of course, Kwadjur Kermani, Sadi, Atar, and Jami, Amir Khosro, Dehlavi, Hafez, and others who don't figure on my list, but they should, in particular, Mir Alishir, Alishir Navoiz. Um, this is one picture from the last of his Khamsa. And the picture was recently identified as an idealized meeting of Jami presenting Ali Shir to the shade of Nezami. It's, um, as I said, one of the last pictures in Navoi's own Khamsa that I think was probably made for a son of Sultan Hussein. All of these manuscripts, moreover, are, of course, gorgeously ornamented, and they would have been splendidly bound in addition to the pictures within them. One more Timurid binding, this made for Ibrahim Sultan in Shiraz. Um, in any case, uh, one should also comment that the observation in a recent related scholarly gathering suggests that Timurid bindings are among the most fragile components of such a volume, fragile in the sense of their physical connection to the text block they surround. Um, they tend often not to have survived. And when Alison Ota was providing me with pictures of bindings, she said, early Timurid bindings are hard because so few of them exist. All right. All these characteristics, patron, place, content, language, script, ornament of all kinds, both abstract and pictorial, do go some way toward defining the look of the Timurid book if primarily at its highest level of production. There's an obvious corollary, quality, both of material and the skills of those who executed that I think must be added to the cast of defining characteristics. S because simply means often assure quality, this is not always the case. I'd suggest then that yet another set of features might help us define the look of the Timurid book. These would be size and scale, shape and proportion. Of course, this is hardly unique to the characteristics of a fine Timurid volume. They also define architecture, as we're going to hear next. Uh, I would just say, having recently been lucky enough to have been in the Registan in Samarkand, how differently one feels walking into the Ulubeg building than in the other two buildings. It's a Timurid building, and its proportions are different, and it feels differently from the other buildings on the square. That said, however, let me now focus on the handwritten and usually handheld manuscript and make several observations. One aspect of the look of the book in the 15th century in Iran is that even closed, they really do have a specific look. So when one unfolds the flap, turns back the cover, and opens the volume, I think that it's immediately clear that even a single page of a good 15th century book displays a proportional layout that is specific to and typical of this period. In Timurid volumes, the height of the ruling, the jadwal, enclosing the rectangle, apparent or implied, of the written surface has a very particular numerical relationship to the width of the unmargined folio in its original size. This may not be quite the same number, but somehow manipulated, reduced by tens and fives, the measurements reveal a discernibly proportional relationship of folio size to written surface. Long ago, I thought I could express it as a simple ratio. Um, so, Sharuth, large Kuliati Tori He, large, folio size of 422 by 315 millimeters, it's pretty big. Um, displays a ratio, again, of the original folio to written surface of four to three. This is exactly the same ratio as are found in the few original pages of the Garrett Zafarnama, which we know was made in 872. Um, 
there are only two original folios left in the manuscript. The rest of it was remargined. But when I played around with this at the time I was working on my thesis, I found that these, that I looked at the appendix in preparing this, um, the Zafarnama is about half as small, half the size, in height at least, as the Kuliati Tarihi, and yet the proportions of folio size and written surface are really the same. I suggest that the same proportional aesthetic is shared by a great many Timurid volumes, more than almost any of us are ever likely to see, measure, and find our notes on. Without carrying this exercise any further, here and now, I would say that with some experience, one can usually tell much about a good Timurid volume, even from its cover, irrespective of its size, and the number of folios and therefore the bulk that it will take up like this. I have to say I've not studied the finer, the princely or courtly Turkmen volumes from this point of view. I could not possibly venture to comment. But I have also observed that no matter the size of a commercial Turkmen volume, it's, that's made in Shiraz in the second half of the century, 15th century, its shape and its proportions really are, that is when they had, hasn't been remargined, are really different from contemporary Timurid volumes. And eventually the same feature, this particular proportion of size and shape, goes far toward defining the shape of the classical Shiraz 16th century volume, with or without illustrations. Its ratio of folio to written surface I long ago found to be five to three. Of course, there are many other features in addition to written surface and the original size of a page that comprise proportionality. Um, we won't even talk about calligraphy. I'm not capable of doing that. But I, it does go without saying that this notion of a proportional relationship of all parts to the whole is not limited to the 15th century, fine or otherwise. Our late colleague and dear friend Shahriar Ad systematically examined all these features in the study of an early 17th century copy of a historical text made in Shiraz, and he reported a similar interlocking and proportional structure. A student of mine in the 1970s was fascinated with these inherent possibilities, and he started to examine a much more important manuscript from our point of view, from this, and from this aspect, the Cairo Bustan, Unfortunately, the law ultimately reclaimed his attention rather than the history of Iranian painting. So the extent to which these physical characteristics really do define all of the 15th century volumes in the East of whatever text, quality, and size is still open to examination. I can only say that in my experience, it seems to hold true for some of the finer 15th century Timurid volumes, historical, as well as belles lettres, illustrated or not, large or small. I'm not uh, uh, going to speak exactly about the topic announced in the program, uh, because in June uh, 2017, I was um, given a, an enormous opportunity uh, to work at the National State Archive in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And I would like uh, to show you some images that I found in the archive uh, concerning the, the topics we've been dealing on size, style, size, scale, shape, and proportion in Timurid architecture. So what do we know about the monuments we analyze and how accurate is our knowledge? Uh, so the heuristic analysis that I'm going to offer today is meant to provide new inquiries and raise new questions that I probably won't be able to answer. So uh, I would like uh, to start with uh, an image that uh, characterizes probably best what I found out. Uh, I've worked with the archives of uh, uh, mostly uh, false scholars. These are uh, uh, Vasily Vyatkin, archaeologist who worked in Samarkand at the turn of the uh, 20th century. Boris Zosipkin, architect, the guy on the image that I started my presentation with, who was in charge of the um, architectural monuments in Samarkand until uh, his death in the 1950s, and who dedicated his life to restoration practices. He worked at Guri Emir and also the Samanid Mausoleum in Bukhara. Uh, 
And the other two scholars that are probably you are most familiar with these names, uh, these are Mikhail Masson and Galina Pugachenkova, whose works have been uh, very, uh, I mean, the basic sources for non-Soviet scholars to study Central Asian monuments due to access, you know, to the sources and due to access to archives. And I would like to compare uh, what I found out in the archives of Vyatkin and Zasipkin to what has been published by Masson and Pugachenkova regarding the Timurid dynastic mausoleum of Guri Emir. Uh, this is Guri Emir in Samarkand, as we see him today. Uh, an incredibly important building, uh, not only for uh, Timurid history, uh, but also for the study of Islamic architecture in general and for its influences later on on Mughal architecture. However, what we see today is uh, hardly what um, we know from the material sources we have of Guri Emir, and namely, this is the photography we use. Uh, Guri Emir has been uh, important for local um, religious practices that have been prohibited during the Soviet period, but still the importance of the locality, the importance of the, of the building, as a place for pilgrimage has remained. Also, Guri Emir uh, has been portrayed in tourist brochures as something worth visiting, and numerous uh, foreign tourists flood Samarkand nowadays to admire Guri Emir. But what they see is something different from what might have been built. So this is the only photograph that we have uh, of Guri Emir uh, from 18, around 1868, 1872. It was published in an album called Turkestansky Album, initiated by um, the um, general uh, Kaufman in, in Samarkand, a Russian general. And uh, these images are available on the website of the Library of Congress. You probably are all familiar with them. What I want to focus today uh, is the fact that Guri Emir uh, has been analyzed as a complete work of art in which we have um, the octagon, the actual mausoleum, with a very tall drum and a ripped dome. We have a courtyard facade and uh, we have what is the remains of a main entrance portal. These are the plans that were published in the Turkestansky album as I mentioned, the mausoleum, the octagon, the entrance portal, the courtyard facade. This is uh, one of the earliest pictures of the entrance portal that has been uh, severely damaged, uh, but nowadays has been uh, heavily restored. Before I continue with the actual architecture of the, of the monument, uh, I was uh, busy in my research with finding out why was Gurimia built where it has been built. So uh, I would like to suggest something that also hasn't been published and uh, afterwards, if we have time for questions, I would like uh, to hear from you what you think about this suggestion. So I think that Guri Emir, this is the uh, map of uh, Samarkand from Google Earth. This is uh, Guri Emir to the uh, southwest of the city. And uh, I think that the monument was built there as a sort of a spiritual axis, combining uh, two other monuments built before uh, Guri Emir. And these were the, uh, the mausoleum of Nur al-Din Basir that was situated uh, here, what used to be uh, the citadel of Samarkand. This is uh, Ruhabad. This is uh, Ruhabad. The, a uh, burial place of another uh, Sufi saint, uh, Burhan Adin Sagarji, uh, Guri Emir, and then here at the bottom we have Aksarai, a very small uh, mausoleum that uh, has been analyzed as something that has been built prior to Guri Emir by Bartolt and Vyatkin, but Pugachenkova has proved that actually it was built uh, in the second part of the 15th century. So uh, the relevance between uh, this is that we have, um, you know, a, a sacred geography of the city, and a, a mausoleum is not built uh, at a random place, so the site is carefully selected. And with Nur al-Din Basir, uh, the mausoleum was built during the Timurid uh, period, so uh, most likely also during the reign of Timur himself. 
And uh, what I'm talking about is that these three mausoleums, uh, so uh, Kutbicha Har, the home, the, the name with which it is known, Ruhabad and Guri Emir were built, or at least Guri Emir initiated during the reign of Timur himself. So uh, the mausoleum was built, as I said, in the um, citadel and the bones of the saint were brought back from outside the citadel because he had uh, lived at the end um, of the 13th century. The building um, has been very poorly recorded because it was destroyed. It was destroyed exactly by uh, General uh, von Kaufmann during the siege of Samarkand. And this is one of the only, uh, I mean, this is an image from the Turkestansky album, but also this book, this is the uh, Samaria, and this is a translation by Veselovsky. There was an earlier translation by Vatkin, but I, I have never had access to it. So I'm using this translation, I have the book. So uh, this is what we have of the mausoleum. Before the Russians blew it up, they drew its plans. So we see here that we have uh, the double dome that is so characteristic of uh, Guri Emir. And we have um, a, a relatively small mausoleum. It was about uh, eight meters, uh, a square shape. And uh, it was erected most likely after Timur uh, created the citadel. And the citadel was created between 1371 and 72. So, um, the, the museum, uh, mausoleum was so well built that there uh, were two attempts to destroy it. Because the first attempt to destroy it was in July 1880, and they needed 3.5 pounds of gunpowder. They did not succeed. So a second attempt uh, took place in August 1880, and the mausoleum was finally uh, destroyed. It was destroyed not because of any uh, particular religious purposes, or this was at least the official discourse, but because it stood you know, uh, in the way of the, of the military. You know, it was, this was supposed to be the Samarkand citadel, um, occupied by General Konstantin Petrovich von Kaufmann. Uh, we have uh, also uh, this photograph that I have not been able uh, to date, based on which Verschagen uh, created uh, this painting. And what is interesting is that uh, the mausoleum was exactly in the main street that runs from the Registan in front of the Tilekeri Madrasa, richting the, uh, to the direction of the citadel. Another painting, so this is, this is the mausoleum and this is Registan Square. Uh, what is characteristic of Samarkand from the time that we have photographs? Because I based my research on uh, photographic images uh, as I think that they're the most accurate uh, you know, description, visual description of the monuments. And I understand that it's uh, very difficult to construct architectural uh, examples in terms of size, scale, shape, and proportion based on textual resources. But I would like to show that um, this is, this is Ruhabad, and in the uh, early years of photography in Samarkand, in the mid of the uh, 19th century, uh, the fabric of the city was very dense. So the attitude towards these monuments was such that they were part, part of the uh, daily living of the people. And these monuments were not, uh, of course, there were no laws for protection, but they were incorporated in the living quarters. And as you can see here, uh, so this is between uh, Ruhabad, the mausoleum that was built for um, um, the uh, Sagarji, and uh, who actually died in China, but the bones were brought to Samarkand by his son, uh, Abu Said, who, who, by the way, also uh, kind of convinced Timur uh, to build the mausoleum of um, Nur al-Din Basir in the citadel. So uh, Ruhabad is the second mausoleum in this uh, kind of uh, sacred uh, urban line. And it was, uh, um, there was this gate between Ruhabad and what later would be uh, Guri Emir. So this gate, we have a description of the gate actually uh, in, the, in the text by uh, Mutribi, which is from 1627, that there was a gate between uh, coming from Ruhabad towards Guri Emir, which is not the entrance portal. So uh, in this sense, we can rely on the sources, but it's very difficult you know, to pinpoint the exact urban location. So about the densely um, populated area between Ruhabad and Guri Emir, this was also perhaps due to the, to the fact of, of getting a blessing, you know, living to an important saint is, is quite important. This is the, uh, how the, the gate looks nowadays. <clears throat> 
What is also very interesting and is not really mentioned uh, in the descriptions of Ruhabad was that there was a house. Actually, Ruhabad was built uh, very close to an old uh, market that used to exist until the 17th century. And similar to the fact that we have at Registan Square uh, a huge marketplace and there was a halus uh, to the south of the Ulhbet Madrasa, uh, also in Ruhabad there was a halus on the other side of the market. These are plants that I have from the archive of Ruhabad. Again, very, very uh, modest mausoleum, square in shape with four arched recesses in the uh, four uh, intersecting axes with a single dome with an octagonal uh, transition zone, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no existence of the drum that we see uh, in Guri Emir. So this, this is uh, what I think might uh, have left from the, from the market. Uh, between Ruhabad and Guri Emir, uh, this is a market for locks, for wooden locks. And this photograph is probably uh, from the beginning of the 20th century or the late 19th century. And uh, we can see that there is a combination of, um, uh, you know, of living, of trading. So these mausoleums are actually living in the fabric of the city. And we should not regard them as something static. You know, this, this whole idea of regarding architecture as, as a monument was, of course, adopted during the Soviet period in terms of uh, architectural policies for uh, preservation. But also in the Islamic world, you know, the, the architectural monument, in particular one that is related to a saint, in particular one that is a mazar, is not a static element in the urban landscape, and we should not study them as such. So also uh, of the urban fabric very close to the, to the walls of uh, Guri Emir, we have descriptions that uh, to, the, to the west, houses were really built onto the walls of the, of the octagon. And this uh, painting by Vereshchagin is a very clear example you know, of the expansion you know, of, the, of the housing. Now I would like to uh, go back to the history of Guri Emir itself. So this is uh, a, p a photograph from the uh, Timurit Museum in uh, Tashkent, and it uh, reflects actually uh, the idea of Soviet scholars of how the ensemble might have looked like. So we have uh, the main entrance portal of the complex, and um, before Guri Emir was built, we have the complex of Muhammad Sultan, of Timur's heir presumptive, uh, who died in 1403. And uh, that, according to uh, the sources, we know that uh, Timur commissioned the mausoleum for him. And afterwards, he was uh, buried himself there. But uh, there is no any indication of the uh, urban surroundings. And this is something like a quote taken out of context. So uh, also, there is no indication here what I'm going to talk about. Um, additions to the complex that were done not by Timur, but were done during the time of Luhbek. And when we talk about um, the importance of Timurid architecture for the development of Islamic architecture, always um, you know, in, in the works of uh, some of the scholars, we, we've underlined the fact that Timur legitimized his rule through the monumentality of his buildings. But if we really look in Samarkand at um, you know, the mausoleums that I showed, if you look at Guri Emir, apart from the Bibi Hanum Mosque, that could not have been built uh, during the, the life of Timur uh, and was most likely completed during the reign of Uluh Beg, there is not a single building that is monumental. You know, we are talking now uh, about size, scale, shape, and proportion. And this monumentality is, is, is something that, that simply cannot be seen in Samarkand. At least, I, I don't see it in Samarkand. The Bibi Hanum Mosque, uh, if we trust Clavijo, is that um, when Timur was not satisfied with the entrance portal and he asked for it to be lowered, he was throwing meat in the pit. And the pit had to be dug in order to put stronger foundations. And Timur left Samarkand on the 27th of November, 1404, and he died in Otra. And it's impossible that uh, a massive monumental building as Bibi Hanum could have been completed within uh, this limited amount of space and also with winter coming very early in that November. <laughs> 
So uh, the one of the most architectural plans, early ones we have of uh, Guri Emir, is by Veselovsky, uh, published in this huge monumental edition on Mecheti Samarkanda from 1905. And what we see in this plan is the octagon. This is the actual mausoleum. And it's, uh, you enter it here from the uh, courtyard, which was the south even of the courtyard, and we have the two minarets. So this minaret uh, collapsed in 1868, and this one collapsed in 1903. What is very important about this plan, and this is the only plan that I think is, is accurate, uh, of all the plans that have been drawn afterwards, and I'll explain why. Because uh, the measurements were provided in meters and such, and uh, if you really analyze it, the Guri Emir is not symmetrical between the two minarets. There is a difference. Uh, it's, uh, it, the, this, the axis of the, of the courtyard is not symmetrical between the two minarets. And also the shape of the octagon. We always consider the octagon to be uh, with ideal sides. So we have eight sides. But if you look at these sides, you see that they are not equal. Also what we see here is this wall that is at an angle, and this is the Eastern Gallery that was built by Ulrich Beck in 1424. In all later uh, plans, this wall would be straightened, and I'll uh, show you some images of what actually happened there. But when we um, analyze the sources, in, in particular Yazdi, who was not uh, in Samarkand at the time when uh, Gurimiya was built, we know that, that the mausoleum was built to the south of, uh, of the Sufa. And uh, in the, of course, you can interpret, you know, the word Sufa as being an elevation or uh, as being something uh, a platform, uh, but it might have been actually used as the south Iwan of, of the courtyard of the complex of Muhammad Sultan. And uh, the archaeological excavations that were done by Vatkin and uh, by Zasipkin confirmed that parts of this southern Iwan of the courtyard were demolished so that the wall of the octagon you know, could be placed against it. So we are talking about a complete courtyard that existed there. And uh, uh, regarding the two minarets, which are now, um, have been restored after 1996, there was a huge discussion how many minarets were there in the courtyard. So Mutribi, who uh, wrote his text for Jehangir in 1627, said that there were three minarets. Well, there were four minarets, as, as, as is logical, in each corner of the courtyard. But Vyatkin, who excavated uh, at Guri Emir in the 1920s, thought that these, the other pair of two minarets would be to the south, simply because of this idea that the mausoleum was built to the south of the, of the Sufa. So he started digging for the minarets, you know, behind the actual mausoleum. But, um, these minarets were part of the initial complex, and they, uh, these two have survived most likely because uh, they were, in a way, supported by the walls of the new mausoleum. And the other two minarets on the other side of the courtyard did not have the supporting wall that might have acted as buttresses.